like y'all to welcome him for coming and sharing with us. Thank you. I'm going to try to stay focused on the actual PowerPoint, and I'm pretty much going to do quite a bit of reading right through in, in, the, um, uh, in order to uh, preserve as much time as possible. And then I'll elaborate a little bit later on, and I've got uh, just some laser printed pictures to show you of some aspects of uh, uh, phenomenon that go on in, um, in the realm of sustainability. Um, my talk is about highlights of great sustainability concepts. Um, sustainability is a very wide-ranging issue. And go ahead and, and flip to the contents real quick. Um, table of contents, uh, I'm going to go to pages three and four, basically. First, I, uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of uh, definitions and concepts that people talk about. So we've got a, a, an understanding of the jargon, and I'm going to brush over some criticisms. I'm going to try not to uh, badmouth Josh too terribly much. Uh, Josh is a great guy doing a great thing. He really glossed over the sustainability aspect of corn production, and uh, I'll get into a little bit of uh, what goes on in soil and energy balance, so on and so forth. Um, actually, I'm going to speak quite a bit about these five sustainability advocates. Uh, the first one's an architect. The second one is a famous old-time sustainable gardener. The third one uh, is a microbiologist who uh, has uh, spawned several labs throughout the world to help promote sustainable um, uh, plant growing. The fourth one is actually an attorney who's a very funny fellow who is also the, the longest continuous uh, columnist for garden writing on the North American continent. He's out of Anchorage, Alaska. And the fifth one is a PhD soil scientist in the New Mexico area, who is the son of a John Deere dealer, and he's probably got one of the most uh, uh, acute grasps on reality of, of plant sustainable growing out of anybody in the world. And, and all of them are very good, but uh, he really understands production agriculture and sustainability and is really doing it. And, uh, uh, the last uh, couple of uh, slides are going to be talking about green ammonia as well as uh, pyrolysis a little bit. Uh, okay, go ahead and flip slides. Sustainability is the capacity to, or, to endure. In ecology, the word describes how biological systems remain diverse and productive over time. Long-lived and healthy wetlands, oceans, and forests are examples of sustainable biological systems for humans. Sustainability is the potential for long-term maintenance of well-being, which has environmental, economic, and social dimensions. And in order, to, uh, in order for a fuel convention or an institution to become sustainable, it first must be able to get established. I think you all can comprehend that notion. Environment is about the surroundings of an object, and economy consists of the economic system of a country or other area, the labor, capital, and land resources, and the economic agents that socially participate in the production, exchange, distribution, and consumption of goods and services of that area. Ecology is the scientific study of the relations that living organisms have with respect to each other. I'm going to take a little bit of time on Liebig's law. This might be foreign um, to you all a little bit. The law of the, of the minimum, often simply called Liebig's law or the law of the minimum, is a principle developed in agricultural science in 1828 by Carl Sprangle 
and later popularized by Justice von Liebig. It states that growth is controlled not by the total amount of resources available, but by the scarcest resource in uh, limiting factor. <coughs> um, they teach about this in the first day or the first week of soil science. Uh, I'll get on to all the essential elements of life, primarily of plants, a little bit later on. Uh, but uh, for now, I just want to say each of the essential elements that keep biology alive have an optimum level on an optimum day. And uh, let's just take nitrogen, for example. If a plant only has three quarters of the nitrogen uh, relative to its optimum, then it is limited to three quarters of the production that it could produce if it had all of its nitrogen. And that goes for all of the other essential elements as well as the um, uh, other resources that go into growing like light levels, temperature, humidity, uh, so on and so forth. Um, Biology is essential complementary or abundantly contained elements in rough descending order in, mole in molar concentration are hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, iron, manganese, copper, zinc, chloride, silicon, boron, molybdenum, nickel, and cobalt. <coughs> You will also find almost every other element on, in the periodical plant in the structures of living organisms. Um, they may be complementary elements or they may be <coughs> toxins in as minute quantity as they exist. Uh, not all of these elements are always considered essential to life, uh, but a lot of leading edge organic type chemists and, and plant physiologists and animal nutrition people will tell you that a lot of the, the very minute elements like nickel and cobalt work as maybe cofactors in enzymatic reactions in, in plant or animal metabolisms. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one. Okay. Uh, sustainability, like I said once before, is very broad. Uh, social and political sustainability have um, very little to do with uh, soil ecology. A lot of gardeners and farmers who are biological uh, focused people don't even think about the social or political sustainability aspects. Or the, sustain, or the economic sustainability aspects until they run up against a capital roadblock or something, or a, a political roadblock with a policy that, that is snuffing out their industry, which um, most of you in this room can identify with because it's, it's given biofuels or liquid motor fuels a, a tough go in the past couple of years. <coughs> I'm going to focus a lot more on agricultural sustainability, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll get back to it. Energy balance, most of you know about energy inputs versus energy outputs. Um, it ties in with, with parasitic energy loss as well as uh, the values of different energy forms. The value of <coughs> a human consumable protein and carbohydrate rich food can be a lot more valuable from a money standpoint, units of dollars, um, than uh, even, uh, you know, in today's current market prices, gasoline, biodiesel, ethanol, biobutanol, butanol, um, whatever, you name the liquid motor fuel, it's reasonably cheap than the actual nutritional value for humans in milk or some other good food. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one. 
Okay, criticisms of biofuels. Uh, it was great that um, the panel got into it last night. There, um, and I'm just rattling off some bullet points. Uh, there is no way to make them economically viable. Um, many of you who are run across the general public who listen to the politicians <coughs> probably heard that one. Um, ecologies are being annihilated. Feedstocks are voracious consumers of nitrogen. Humans are starving as machines get fuel. Okay, now this one is pretty dear to my heart because I got paid for the last five years to tag along with garden riders and public speakers to talk about sustainability. 75 pounds of soil is lost for all of the farmed feedstock necessary to make every gallon of biofuel produced. I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a little bit. There is not enough dry land on the planet to grow enough biomass feedstock to replace fossil fuels. Now, if all of the knowledge you had was as a result of Josh's uh, film or talk last night, you'd think, well, this is uh, not very true. Um, <clears throat> I have gone to a couple of uh, algal biomass conferences, and in one of the conferences I went to, one of the speakers mentioned a data point which was if we were to use a third of the water that came out of the mouth of the Mississippi River that would be enough water to grow enough algae to replace all of the liquid motor fuels used on the North American continent and we're just one continent and we are a very agriculturally land rich continent per capita if you look at the populations of Asia and Europe, in places in Africa and South and South America, uh, there are far too many people on this planet consuming liquid motor fuels for us to produce um, all land-based or terrestrial crop-derived liquid motor fuels to replace petroleum, given our current uh, machine infrastructure with, with transportational machinery. Okay, go ahead and go to the next one, please. Apologize for a little scrunch. Uh, this is just another quick review of who I'm going to talk about. Uh, William McDonough. Um, let's just go to the next one. Okay, William McDonough is an American architect, and uh, he has teamed up with a chemist named Michael bon Braungart. And they have authored a book called Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way Things. And they, they also did another book a few years back. Um, I saw him as a keynote speaker at the Garden Writers Conference uh, about five years ago in Valley, Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. And uh, he rattled off uh, a little bit about an Atlantic Monthly article titled 1491, which was the year before Columbus hit the Western Hemisphere. And uh, uh, the article basically made a case that prior to Western Europeans showing up in the Western Hemisphere, uh, the quote unquote indigenous people uh, pretty much lived in an Eden, and they, they were um, subsistence type aboriginal people, and they went and picked what they liked and they ate it, or they modified the growth of plants. I'm going to um, segue into talking about kufia real quick, which is a potential feedstock for, um, for biodiesel. It's a, a seed plant which uh, if you press the seed makes a really nice oil that's got a really low gel point and that's really good for uh, biodiesels in northern climates. Kufia is also what they call an indeterminate plant which means not all of the seeds ripen at once and this is something I never thought about until I read this article over years and years of humans gathering grains like wheat, oats, barley, etc., we have picked the easiest seed by hand um, to harvest. So if we could grab a whole handful of seeds and throw them in a pouch, we just genetically selected a quality trait of a plant. 
Kufia, we've only been selecting for you know 40 or 50 years, if that much. And um, so some of the seeds of it are ready in June, July, August, through whenever it freezes. So it's very difficult to harvest a kufia plant with a big yield all at once. So uh, I did read there are some uh, breeders, I believe, if I remember right, in North Dakota, Indiana, and Oregon that are selecting to make kufia a more determinate plant. That's just one example of humans nipping things in the bud and creating intent. Okay, um, I'm just going to rattle off a couple of his quotes. Uh, humans apparently for millennia have been walking around nipping things in the bud. By exhibiting our preferences, we show those things that we intend. We intend to thrive, we intend to survive, and we intend to enjoy the future. And design, which is a very dear word, word for architects or regional planners, is the first signal of human intention. What are our intentions? At this point in history, our intentions have to be looked at on the level of our species. Human beings dominate 99% of the Earth's surface. 99% of large mammals in the world are under human management. Under human management. So we see that we have the ability to affect, to affect the entire planet with our actions. These decisions, these changes, are of our own making. The first question McDonough's design, McDonough's design firm asks when starting a project is, how do we love all of the children of all species for all time? And uh, his firm's technological goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, water, soil, and power, dear to our hearts, economically, equitably, and elegantly enjoyed. Go ahead. Currently, there are tragedies in the making. We see climate change, we see endocrine disruption, we see soil loss, we see diversity loss, we see plastics in the ocean, we see acidifications of the oceans. In the Pacific Gyre, which is where the currents swirl into a very concentrated uh, center point, they found six times as much plastic as plankton. It comes from the storm drains of the west coast of the United States. 48% of all of the anthropogenic carbon, which is what comes from humans, ends up in the ocean. For millions of years, the historic ocean pH which is the balance of acidity versus alkalinity, has been in the range of 8.2 to 8.8, .8, which is fairly alkaline. It is now at 8.6, which is approaching neutral, and that's a logarithmic scale. And it will be at 7.9 by the end of the century. And that is acidic enough to demineralize the bottoms of the coral reefs, as well as oyster and clam shells. We see heavy metals, contamination, and salination. We can't, in this point in our history, say that it is not part of our plan. It is our plan, our intention, because we have no other plan. We have a de facto plan. If you don't have a good, high quality plan, you have a de facto. When delivering a speech to the Bush administration, and he joked about having to do it twice, uh, a DOE employee asked, what do you think about clean nuclear power? And he responded, I love clean nuclear power. I'm particularly attracted to nuclear fusion. I think we should spend a trillion dollars capturing nuclear fusion immediately. And thank God we've already got our nuclear reactor exactly where we need it. 93 million miles away, it's eight <laughs> minutes, and it's wireless. <laughs> and he was speaking to the garden writers, so he, he had an off-the-cuff com off comment. I think we recognize all of our gardens are nuclear power. If we all went back to being hunter-gatherers, the Earth could only support 400 million people. 
we now have 6.9 billion. That pretty much uh, is self-explanatory. There is no going back without mass uh, or, or mortality of human beings. <laughs> okay, go ahead and go to the next one. There are over 500 human-made human -made chemicals that are now persistent, and many of them travel to great distances and bioaccumulate in our fats. McDonough's inspirational message is that in order to endure, we need to create a great intention. Then we must create a great plan. Let's put a great effort into our design in order to stave off what happens when we rely upon a de facto plan. Okay, and, and this quote here is a, a quote from a garden writer that wrote a little post-conference article about him. Our keynote speaker was tremendous. The best presentation I have ever heard. It left me sobbing in my seat, and I wasn't the only one moved to tears. William McDonough is truly a hero for the planet, and we can save this world. Go now and read about him, and get his book, Cradle to Cradle. Okay, um, and this is just a little bit about her. Um, okay, go ahead and go to the next one. John Jevons uh, lives, I think, pretty close to Willits, California, which is about an hour and a half or two hours north of San Francisco. And uh, is it then when you visit your okay, up there, right? Around the corner. You could probably uh, elaborate about him quite a bit. Uh, he's an interesting fellow. I first saw him at a conference called Eco Farm, which uh, goes on at the Silmar in uh, the Monterey Bay area of California every uh, January. And um, I'm just going to um, read the bullet points real quick in the interest of time. He has developed a sustainable eight step food raising method known as Grow Biointensive. The method now enjoys widespread pra practice and development. Some of the most notable data points John has impressed are growing one pound of food causes a farmer to lose 12 pounds of soil. Okay, and, and th this is where I kind of park past with Josh, by the way. Even organic farmers lose eight pounds of soil. In China, Farmers lose upwards of 15 pounds of soil for every food a pound produced. Since it takes a thousand years in nature to make one inch of soil, and approximately 10 times the amount of soil is lost for every pound of food that's produced, modern industrial farming as we know it is not sustainable. Nor is farmed corn, soybeans, or canola sustainable for produced biofuels. Um, I just want to say one, one more little point about that. When I first heard Jevin say that, I didn't believe it. But if you dig into some of his articles, you'll understand that every time you run a plow through a farm field, you open it up and you hasten the rate with which microbes respirate organic matter. So basically, it lifts off the CO2. Now in the short run, you can grow high yielding crops and compete with your neighbor. But in the long run, you're going to do destruction of your soil. And when I was in school 30-ish years ago, I recall the soils professors saying, our farmers farm with a 10-year mentality. And when I did plant nutrition in the Salinas Valley and the San Joaquin Valleys of California and the Santa Maria Central Coast area, I got what they were talking about. Um, something goes on in, in this intensive row crop farming that I call um, Darwinistic crop rotation. You will get a farming corporation to lease land for upwards of 12,000 bucks an acre per year and they will get two and a portion crops per year off of that land. And they've got a rotation of two or three crops. And they will farm that land until they have a crop failure that makes it so it's no longer profitable for them to farm that land. Then they'll let go of their lease, and another farming group will come in with another specialty of crops. And they'll be able to do it on their land. 
Now, a lot of those uh, alluvial soils along coastal California are very deep. They're, they're upwards of 200 feet deep. But many places on all continents have very thin soils. And I recall a time going to Oklahoma just after my son was born about 16 years ago. I went from uh, Norman, which is where Oklahoma University is, uh, up to I think Springfield, where, where Oklahoma State is, the Ag School. And there was all this gorgeous rangeland, and nobody was growing any crops. It was all just being grazed. And I found one tractor dealer, and I literally went in and said, how come nobody's farming this land? And he, he literally said, because the soil blew all the way. It really did. The dust bowl really happened. And there are you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of acres of land that have been destroyed. Uh, that's why our soil conservation service has been started, and now it's called Natural Resource Conservation Service. Okay, I'm going to jump into this a little bit. An acre furrow slice is assumed to be the volume or soil in an acre of topsoil. It is considered six to seven inches deep and weigh two million pounds. In other words, an acre of soil is good for approximately 166,666 pounds of food, or roughly 24 gallons of liquid motor fuel. There are 22 billion acres of ecologically productive land and 7 billion people. A human eats about 80,000 80, pounds of food in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. Thus, we have enough soil for about 15 million people <coughs> in the next 6,000 years. Yeah, it's kind of simplified. It's kind of Josh as I understand. Um, but um, the moral to the story is uh, we've got a severe soil limit. And uh, if we keep rising in population and we keep farming in a very exploiting fashion, to our soils, we're all going to be eating hydroponic food very soon. There's plenty of nutrients in the ocean, we're not going to run out, but it's going to get a lot more expensive. Okay, um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, um, there we go. Okay, uh, have many of you heard Michu Kaku speak? Okay, great. Um, when I was going through my divorce, I used to have a lot of insomnia, and he used to be on late night radio with Art Bell. And uh, one night he was talking about this Kardashev scale, which basically um, puts humanity in a, in a cosmic perspective um, that we are in a race to basically get off the planet before we gobble up all of the energy provided by the planet first. And then we are in a race to get out of our solar system before we gobble up all of the energies um, provided by the solar system. And then we are in a race to get out of our galaxy before we gobble up all of the energy to get out of our galaxy. Um, he talks about civilization types. Uh, uh, type 3 civilization got hacked off. It's a kind of Macintosh Windows compatibility issue. But anyhow, type one is a civilization uh, working on eating all of the energy uh, on the planet. Type two is, is the solar system, and type three is the galaxy. And we are not quite to, or we're not even anywhere near a type one civilization yet. And I just threw that into the PowerPoint to illustrate the extreme sustainability world consciousness thinking. Okay, go ahead and go to the slide. Okay, Elaine Ingham is a, a controversial lightning rod woman. Um, she has, uh, she basically um, got fired from Corvallis, Sword and State University for um, outing somebody doing Monsanto-sponsored research. I think it was Monsanto. Percent sure. Uh, they created a GMO that was able to basically turn anything in a soil ecology into alcohol to become a motor fuel. And uh, 
Uh, she basically outed the, the group of researchers who were working on that and said if that gets out into our environment, imagine the destruction that could do if that could replicate. Now, as my good friend John Muser will tell you, it's pretty tough for GMO organisms to get out in the world and, and live. And uh, I, I agree that's true. I still think there should be GMO protocols, an acid test, whether or not they should be able to be marketed out in the environment. Yeah. And I would, I would challenge that still the starling corn and a bunch of other things. There's a ton of genetically modified stuff that contaminates our food. I agree. And uh, when they say put these controls, it okay. seems like stuff that would be abundant and abundant. But Very true. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, Jeff Lowenfels is a very funny <coughs> author. Um, he was a courtroom litigator, he's <coughs> great in front of people. This is his first edition. It's called Teeming with Microbes, T-E-A-M-I-N-G, which uh, is a double entendre. Um, and basically, he has popularized many of the notions that uh, Elaine Ingham Soil Food Web Labs have been working with sustainable farmers around the world using. If, if you really want to learn quite a bit, you can read this book. I know one person who's done it in one sitting. I did it only flying on airplanes, and it took me about five flights. I'm not a very fast reader. Um, and uh, basically, the Soil Food Web talks about anything from uh, bacteria microbes to fungi to microarthropods to arthropods, worms, birds as vectors transporting nematodes around through soil. They all kind of live together and work together. And in nature, they uh, uh, tend to flourish. If you look out of that forest, it's boom. And we haven't done anything to it. Go ahead and go to the next speaker real quick. I'll elaborate more um, if we've got more time. Okay, <coughs> this fellow Michael Melendrez is one of the most uh, impressive people I've ever run across. He is, uh, he is in uh, a little bit south of Albuquerque, and uh, he sells soil that he creates. He creates an in-vessel compost from sustainable crops that he grows. He grows a wide variety of legumes in the pea and bean family, as well as corn, and he composts them before they're fed to animals. And the reason why he does it is for a very wide array of uh, amino acids, which are the building blocks to proteins. In other words, he creates a soil with a balanced diet for the plants that are going to be fed a balanced diet. He doesn't just compost reactively the food waste in the yard. And uh, he himself is successful. And what just lit up a light bulb in my head with him was his entire fertilizer program on his own crops is basically a cover crop in the fall when, when he's not growing a production crop. And 15% um, of the biomass that he harvests, he puts back into his soil. So basically, He's got an energy balance gain of approximately 85% relative to 15%. And um, so a lot of us think about energy balance as far as the inputs going into a corn crop or soybean crop relative to the amount of BTUs we get out of that crop per unit area. In a soil ecology, it's pretty much the same again, only you need foods for the entire soil food web that they can digest. They cannot have an interruption of the food supply. If they run out of food, their populations die out. And a lot of people who are machine people, like ourselves, have no idea that almost half of the thermonuclear radiation that comes from the sun and gets photosynthesized into carbohydrates and amino acids gets exuded out of root systems, the plant exudates that, that are sugar and protein rich. And plants do that to feed soil ecologies. And they trade carbos and proteins to soil microbes, etc., in exchange for inorganic elements. Some of the elements on the periodic chart that I showed you earlier. 
and um, in a forest, which is uh, you know a very mature um, uh, environment relative to like fresh lichen on, on a newly formed lava rock, you get orders of magnitude more production of total biomass than you do on a row crop field for an annual crop that we typically grow as an energy crop. And there's no, no cultivation and there's no fertilization for these old growth forests. So after getting that notion, which I actually got from the Elaine Ingham workshops, um, I became a tremendous advocate of perennial crops as opposed to annual crops. Do we have anything else here? Um, yeah, we should have. Go ahead and go. Um, okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about green ammonia. And boning up for this talk, I ran across green ammonia. How, how many people here have read about using ammonia as a liquid motor fuel? Or know anything about it? Okay, this is something we should seriously take a look at. Um, some of the, the big freighters are, are putting urea in fuels now. How many people have heard about that? Okay, urea is a modifying, modified form of ammonia with a fair amount more carbon in it. And um, so I'm just gonna go over the bullet points of it real quick. Uh, it has no carbon emissions because it's NH3. It burns in inter internal combustion engines. Engines can run at a 25 to 1 compression ratio, which uh, is much higher than diesel engines. Even. So you can get closer to the idea of car not engine and efficiency with ammonia. It requires no energy plantations. It has uh, been used to fuel vehicles since 1933. Less ammonium or ammonia fertilizer plus more ammonia fuel equates to less habitat destruction. The Josh talked about the big short-term environmental catastrophe in uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico, but he didn't talk about the ongoing environmental um, catastrophe of, of the dead zone at the mouth of the Mississippi River, which has been going on from you know his uh, uh, ethanol producing buddies in the Midwest for many years. So I think we're up to six or seven million square miles of dead coral reefs at the mouth of the Mississippi River. And actually one of the things I'm kind of uh, working on a little bit is a stabilized form of green ammonia uh, that won't immediately leach out into the ecologies and, and get into the aquifers and, and go out the Mississippi River and kill coral. Um, okay, unlike for all the uh, terrestrial biofuels in summation, all of them put together, there is enough dry land on Earth to produce enough economically viable green ammonia fuel to fuel our entire fuel appetite, the transportation of fuel appetite. Uh, basically, we've gotten our costs of electricity down to roughly five cents a kilowatt hour right at a wind generator's electrodes. And if we can take five cents a kilowatt hour electricity and, and run it through a nitrogen producing power process electrolyzer, we can create $500 a ton ammonia. And the world market price is about $1,000 a ton. And the, the United States, I, I don't know the, the data for, for uh, Canada, but the United States imports, I think, 70 or 80 percent of all of the ammonia it uses for farming. So we have a, a greater trade imbalance for nitrogen fertilizer than we do for petroleum in North America. And um, we can potentially just bypass all of the trans esterification nightmares and create a liquid motor fuel out of ammonia. Now, the one drawback I have found about ammonia is it's got less energy density when it's in a liquid form than gasoline or diesel. 
a lot of people don't realize. They just think, oh, there's more BTUs in a gallon of diesel than there are in gasoline, so diesel is a better fuel. There are efficiency factors as well. The, the, the bigger the, the combustion chamber and the bigger the cylinders and displacement of the engine, the more of an economic advantage there is for, for compression combustion engines relative to spark combustion engines. But a lot of people don't realize there's actually more BTUs per unit mass of gasoline than there is in diesel. A lot of the advancements of gasoline came in the World War II era, uh, era when they needed aircraft fuels for um, spark combustion engines. So um, avgas is for um, spark ignition engines is better than it is for diesel engines for airplanes. Now, the av gases for jets these days are more on the lines of kerosene, which um, is uh, a, a totally different subject. But anyhow, um, uh, ethanol is approximately 65% the energy density of gasoline. Do you have something to say? I have a question on the way for you. Okay. Um, Biodiesel is slightly less uh, energy dense than than regular diesel or dyno diesel per unit volume. Uh, ammonia is about half the energy density of the other liquid molecules. So the drawback is it's got a, a pretty good vapor pressure, so you need pretty you need you need containers that can contain uh, like propane. That, that kind of um, uh, vapor pressure. Uh, and you only have half the energy per unit volume that you do gasoline or diesel approximately. So that's the drawback of ammonia. The upside to ammonia is we don't need to destroy our soil ecologies and I'd rather see ammonia uh, fueling our transportation fleet than killing the coral reefs in uh, the Caribbean. Mexico. Um, let's see. And uh, I, I do want to touch upon um, something that just blew my mind when, when Josh said this last night. He said something to the effect that we have enough resources for dry land crops to pretty much replace petroleum. It's been quite a while since I crunched the numbers. But uh, in my literature searching, um, I didn't see there was any way that we could replace all of the liquid motor fuels from petroleum um, by growing land-based crops. Um, now, algae, uh, which John Muser will get into to a great degree, um, has the approximate theoretical potential of 6,000 gallons of bio oil per acre per year so per acre of sunlight shield in the ideal areas like Phoenix, Arizona, or places in Australia or Hawaii. Uh, in more marginal sunlight areas, the yield only goes down from there. And I'm sure John will true up my numbers tremendously when he does this talk. Uh, go ahead and. Um, uh, oh, so yeah, go I, ahead. The carbon piece is really clear to me because there's no carbon in that. Uh, yeah. Actually, the knots in the shins. That's right. You, you can have. You can have NOx emissions. That's why I specifically worded you no know, carbon emissions, I think. Yeah, that's why I, I saw it. There's no carbon emissions. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, how do you favor um, diatomic nitrogen coming off of the green ammonia as, as opposed to uh, NOx? I don't have a formulation. Oh, okay. Good. So what possible solutions I've been thinking about a lot lately like, is taking in urea and then mixing that as a NOx uh, system. Uh -huh. So you can then form ammonia nitrate as a solid uh, byproducts, you actually have a car as a fertilizer production machine. Awesome. Awesome. So then you get ammonia as a combustion product, you take your NOx and then it's that <coughs> and piss, and you make fertilizer out of that, which then you take to the gas station and sell, dump it out, and then get your new ammonia, basically. Right. You need to team up with the truth, and he's, he's the man to develop the process. Right? So that'd be really Oh yeah, so I, I, I formally agree. Another aspect of energy and soil ecology, um, you know, N2 nitrogen, which is the lion's share of our Earth's atmosphere, is at one of the most reduced states. 
um, or at the most reduced state it can be at. In other, in other words, it's energy void. Go ahead. Five minutes. Okay, thanks. And um, when, when we electrolyze Earth atmosphere and create ammonia or ammonium or ammonia nitrate, we actually add energy into the chemical equation. And that energy we put into those molecules when we build them makes the nitrogen available for organisms to metabolize. So um, approximately 40% of all of the energy used on an annual crop, like corn, wheat, soybeans, et cetera, including the transportation of costs and, and the plowing costs, et cetera, goes into the making, the building of that nitrogen molecule that is food for the plants. It also has a capability of completely throwing off the soil ecology, throwing it out of balance, and absolutely annihilating life in the soil. And since we do have a couple more minutes, I'm just gonna spend 10 seconds on each of these pictures, and if you got time, um, if you want to look out, feel free. This is soybean in a Roundup Prairie field. You'll see this, this stubble from the year before. This is corn following corn in a Roundup Prairie field. It looks pretty dead. This is my original inspiration. This is a Chevron station with lines of cars. This is from NREL's uh, uh, visitor center, by the way. Um, I, I remember being in a car with my mother when I was a little kid waiting to buy gas on the right day. <laughs> This is a picture of, of uh, switchgrass, which uh, doesn't need any cultivation. It just grows and grows and grows. Um, th this is what it takes to biologically grow things. Um, you'll see my picture on the ladder. Um, you'll see a lot of competition of uh, native plants snuffing out my invasive species, which are my energy crop plants. Uh, this is my biomass harvester and my biomass uh, uh, transportation device. This is what should be going on in soil ecologies. You'll see worms and fungi and bacteria breaking down biomass. Those other pictures you'll see, there, there's nothing breaking down that biomass. This is a mature brassica or ACA, which is pretty closely related to uh, canola. This is a picture of another bean. Uh, this is uh, an ideal that a lot of people strive for, working landscapes, picturesque, beautiful places like Vancouver Island, where people are getting uh, an income off of land for uh, producing food and fuel, possibly. This is a soybean crop that's been sprayed four times by Roundup. It's a Roundup ready soybean. And there's another picture I've got in there. It's four days later, and you'll see um, the puncture vines, you can't tell they were sprayed four days later. This is a horse trailer with kind of a joke slogan on it, save on fuel. <laughs> this is a picture, a big, big pile of, of wood chips in northern Indiana. This is a picture of corn cobs, close up of a, a big pile of corn cobs. You'd think they'd use that for fuel. Anybody guess what they use it for? Organic recyclable kidney. <laughs> this, this is a picture of a commercial bog. This is uh, actually on my land where fertilizer drift killed my milkweeds, um, which it was a puzzle to me until I talked to the farmer and he said, oh yeah, I've already applied by crop duster three times. Um, now these guys are sustainable. These are the methods. <laughs> They know what they're doing, they're intelligent people, and they're shrewd business people. <laughs> um, th oh, this is the soybeans four days after the spray. And uh, I've been playing around with algae a little bit this year. Um, that, this algae is actually fertilized with uh, uh, synthesized nitrogen, and I got a tremendous bloom. And I've been playing around with natural um, fertilizer feeds. It's much, much more difficult to get this kind of bloom with, with natural fertilizers than it is by a fertilizer that has been synthesized. Uh, and I'm including the, the fertilizers from you know, um, animal feeds. They are originally synthesized. One minute. Okay. 
And this, this is just uh, algae that's a little bit more mature, that's off gassing. John thinks it's primarily uh, oxygen. Okay, I'm done. Anybody got any questions? We're actually going to pause okay. those that need to go and get out of here for lunch. You're welcome to take off, and then we'll let him start answering some questions just so we don't get you too late. But we'd like to thank you for coming, and it's been incredible. <laughs> Stay and ask a couple questions. You're more than welcome. For those that want to get out and head off to lunch, go ahead. Lunch or breakfast? How do you spell Kupia? C U P H E A. I may not have pronounced it right.